Jesu, standing before you is Pastor S. Meiwa, and we are going to be continuing with our study on God and delegated authority under the topic, uh, Spiritual Protocol. Our foundational scripture is found in Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and verse 2, which reads as follows. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Let us pray. Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we thank you for this opportunity that you are affording us to come and eat at your table the bread that you have prepared for us. We pray that you may open our minds and our hearts to be able to receive your word. I also pray that as I stand before your people that you may speak through me, that you may be able to convey that which you want to convey I pray that you may remove any kink and any obstruction that might be within me, that might hinder the flow of your spirit. I pray that your will may be able to prevail on this day and everything that you want to say, may I be a mere mouthpiece that you may be able to teach us your weight in the name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray, amen. As we have been reading in our foundational scripture that is found in Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and verse 2, these are the following things that we are able to gather from this verse. God commands all of us to be subject to governing authorities. As you would remember in Matthew chapter 22, verse 21, this is when the, Lord, the Pharisees, they came to the Lord Jesus Christ and they asked him, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar? Then the Lord Jesus Christ asked them to bring a coin, and he said unto them, Whose inscription and whose image is on this coin? And they responded, and they said, It's Caesar's. And then the Lord said, Give therefore what belongs to God, that which, and, and, and give what belongs to God, that which is God's, and give that which belongs to Caesar, that which is Caesar's. So this means that when they were asking according or is it lawful for us to pay taxes, they were not asking according to the law of the Romans, but according to the law of God, which is the law of Moses. So the Lord in this way was answering and saying that it is indeed lawful according to the law of God to subject yourself under the governing authorities. Whatever command that they give, you must submit to it. Therefore, he said, it is indeed lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar. We also gather um, another thing that everyone in authority has been appointed by God. Whether that person that is sitting in authority is a good person or whether he is a harsh person, but the fact remains that he has been appointed by God. Also, we gather that even if you look at, 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 at Pharaoh, Pharaoh was not a good uh, or a preferable uh, uh, delegated God's authority, but God has affirmed him that he is his delegated authority because he says in his word that he has raised Pharaoh that he may show his power uh, in him and that his name may be declared in all the earth. So now, to resist authority is to resist what God has ordained. Now, we also gather that this scripture says, um, whoever resists authority brings judgment on themselves. 
So this is clear to us that if you resist authority, then judgment looms on your head. Throughout all scripture, from Genesis to the book of Revelation, we see God delegating his authority. So it is God's intention and God's purpose and God's desire to delegate authority unto men. From the book of Genesis, after God has restored the earth to its former glory, we see him delegating his authority. So now God restored the earth because the word of God in Genesis chapter 1, it says the earth was void and without form, and then what the, water, the, the, the spirit was hovering upon the face of the water. So God, in the book of Genesis, restored the earth, and then after restoring the earth to its previous glory, then he said, now let us make men in our own image. And then after making men in his own image, then he delegated his authority unto the men. So from the onset, from the first book, when we open the Bible, we see God delegating authority. So this, this tells us the desire and the intention of God when it comes to delegating and sharing authority with men. Let us read the book of Genesis, verse, chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make men in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So we see here God making or forming man in his own image. Afterwards, he says to him, he gives him authority over the birds of the air, over everything that creeps on the earth, and over everything that is in the seas, including the underworld. So now we see God giving authority over to men whom he has created. Now God honors authority and respects his delegated authority. Now when you read in the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 2, verse 19, you will understand that after God has formed uh, man in his own likeness, then the word of God tells us that he made uh, all the creatures of the earth and the birds of the air, and then he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. So because God in Genesis chapter 1 had given authority to men, he did not now have a right to name the animals, but he had to bring them to, 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 to Adam whom he had, dele he had delegated authority to, so that Adam may give name to these animals that God has formed. Now we see the importance of delegated authority because from the onset, from the book of Genesis, we see the first person uh, to delegate authority or to submit to authority, it is God. This then shows us the importance of submitting under delegated authority. If God himself is able to submit under men whom he has created just because he has delegated authority to him, how much more us? Also in the book of Genesis, we see the first delegation of authority, as I said. We see the first submission to delegated authority. Who was the first being to submit to the delegated authority? It was not men but it was God. It was God who submitted to the authority that he has handed over to Adam. He had made the animals, and after making the animals, he did not name them, but he allowed Adam to name the animals. And the word of God says that whatever name that Adam gave to a creature, that was its name. We also see in the book of Genesis the failure of delegated authority. We know what happened to Adam. So let us read the, 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 the book of Genesis, chapter 2, from verse 16. It says, And the Lord commanded men, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat 
you shall surely die. So now, this is God giving the instruction or a command unto men, saying, of every single tree that is in the garden, you may eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good, of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat, for on the day that you eat, you are going to die. So we see here the first commandment that has been given unto men, he disobeyed it, he failed to submit to it. We also see the cause of failure. What was the cause of failure of men? It was disobedience. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. What does it say? It says that when men uh, had eaten of the fruit that was forbidden by God to eat, then they saw that they were naked. So this is uh, the act or the, the, the result or the cause of failure for men. It was disobedience because God had commanded them in Genesis chapter 2 not to eat, but when they saw that the fruit was good, then they saw that uh, it was desirable, then they took of it and they partook. And the word of God says, the woman first took and eat, and then he gave to the man, and he also eat. So the failure of the delegated authority was disobedience. And what was the consequence of that failure? The consequence of failure was nakedness. Let us read the book of Genesis chapter 3 from verse 6 to 7, which reads as follows. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruits and ate. She also gave to the husband, to her husband, with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and sewed thick leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, after eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then they saw that they were naked. But when you look at the book of or the psalmist David in Psalms chapter, chapter 8, it reveals to us that man initially was not naked, but he was crowned with glory and honor. The word crown also means to encircle, also means to surround. So man was covered with the glory of God. So upon eating and partaking of the forbidden tree or the forbidden fruit, men failed and the consequences of that failure was nakedness. So now we see that the act of disobedience or failure to obey as a delicate authority will lead to nakedness. When men fell into this sin of disobedience, he did not only become a slave of sin, but he also lost God-given authority and position. What do we mean by that? In Romans chapter 6, verse 16, it says, To whom you submit yourself as slave to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey. So as men obeyed the enemy, which is Satan, he became a slave of Satan. Now, being a slave of someone means that whatever that you own, whatever that you are, it belongs to your master. So now, the authority that God had given men, uh, he lost it through disobedience, and it became at the disposal of Satan, as well as the position. What position is that? The position of being called, or of being the son of God. Because if you look at the book of Luke, chapter 3, verse 38, it tells us that Adam was the son of God. So, therefore, we see now that when man fell, he lost that authority, and he also lost the position. So, God's work of redemption did not only deal with our sin, but it also restored the authority as well as the position which man lost in the Garden of Eden. 
Let us look at uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 5 and verse 6. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give it, I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered unto me, and I give to whom ever I wish. So now this is the enemy, Satan, appearing in the Lord in the wilderness to tempt him. And the word of the Lord says that he offered the Lord Jesus Christ all the kingdoms of this world. He says this way, for all this has been handed over or has been delivered unto me. How was it delivered unto him? It was delivered through the disobedience of men. As I've said earlier, that the principle stands that whomever you give your slaves to, to obey, you are that one, to whomever you give your slave to, to, to submit to, you are that one slave whom you obey. So, as Satan, as Adam obeyed the enemy, so he became the slave of Satan, and therefore everything that he had or everything that God had entrusted him with, it was given over to Satan. That is the authority that was handed over to, 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 to Satan by Adam, the authority over the earth. Now let us look at Job chapter, chapter 1 verse 6 to see how, to, 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 to testify or to show us that even the position that Adam held was also handed over to Satan. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. So why was Satan having this, 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 this grace or having this opportunity to appear before God along with the sons of God. It was because he had also usurped or taken authority of being the son of God from Adam. Now, was God's intention to delegate his authority frustrated because men had fallen into sin? Absolutely not. Even though the first man, Adam, and the subsequent man, every man who followed after him, disappointed God, yet he did not abort his intent of delegating his authority. How do we see that God did not abort his intent and his purpose of delegating authority? This purpose of God, why, did not, why God did not uh, uh, abort this, 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 this intent or this intention of this purpose of his? It is because his purpose is eternal. It is beyond time. It stems from eternity past. How do we see that? We see that because the work of re we see that through the work of redemption. The work of redemption is eternal. It is not. It was not instituted uh, in the terra firma or in earth or in time, but it was instituted in the eternity past. That's why Revelation 13 tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundations of the earth. Now, let us look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, reading the scripture, we are able to glean and get that we were chosen by God before the foundation of the earth. And the purpose or the reason God chose us before the foundation of the earth was that we should be holy unto him, meaning we should be separated unto him we should be his holy people. We should be his people who are sanctified. So that was the reason why God uh, uh, elected us or chose us from the foundation of the earth. And it also gives us another reason, so that we may be blameless or without blame or without fault before him. This means that 
Before God formed men, he saw men falling, and therefore he devised a plan in eternity past before creating men to redeem men, because he saw men being guilty before him, he saw men having fault, and therefore he sent his son to die on our stead so that we may be blameless. So when God now, so it has been God's intention to redeem men. Now, this redemption is coupled with what? With the restoration of man's uh, authority as well as position. So, as we have proved that the redemption or the plan of redemption of man is from eternity past because God chose us before the foundation of the earth that we should be holy and without blame before him. So, when God now sent forth his son to redeem men, this redemption plan was coupled with the restoration of the authority of men as well as the position of men of being what? The son of God. Because when men fell, he saw he lost that position of being called the son of God. That's why the word of God says, to whoever has accepted him, they were given what? The authority to be called the sons of God. Whoever accepted who? Accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. He was given the authority to be called the son of God. Therefore, we say his plan of delegating authority is eternal. That's not frustrated or terminated by the fall of man. So now that we have therefore proved that the plan of God of delegating authority was not frustrated by the fact that man was uh, men disobeyed God, but it still stands even now because this plan of God of delegating authority unto men is eternal as it is coupled with what? With the plan of redemption. So God continued to delegate his authority even unto the church. Let us look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, this binding and loosing speaks of the authority God had conferred unto men. Now, let us also read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 to 11 to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the church or by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God's eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord was that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now, this manifold wisdom of God cannot be made manifest or made known by the church if authority has not been given or delegated to the church. So, God has delegated authority to the church so that the church will be able to manifest this manifold wisdom of His. Now, our God has a school, and that school is called the school of servanthood. So, what is the school of servanthood? The school of servanthood is an institution for breeding authority. It is an institution where God forms the character of his future delegated authority. If God wants to raise a man 
to be his delegated authority, he first submits this man into the school of servanthood, where God forms and changes his character to conform to the standard that he desires so that that man will be his faithful delegated authority. This institution is actually God set men under whom he places his future authority to serve under. So God takes a man whom he desires to delegate authority to, and then he places him under a set man whom he alone chooses so that this man will be able to submit, this man will be able to serve under this uh, set man. Now, the reason why God places this man or this uh, 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 potential delegated authority under this man is so that he may be able to learn these two major uh, 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 subjects, uh, which are submission and obedience. So now, in this school of servanthood, there are these two major subjects. That is submission as well as obedience. It is therefore important to look closely at these two modules, which are these two subjects, so that we, as we enroll in this uh, school, we put conscious effort and diligence to make sure that we succeed or we pass these modules. Now, passing these two major modules will mean readiness to be trusted with God's authority. Now, let us look at the first one, which is submission. The first encounter with the term submission is Genesis chapter 16, verse 9. Genesis chapter 16, verse 9. We are going to look at the first encounter of the word submission. Why? Because in scripture, where the word or the term or the doctrine is first mentioned, that is where we get the most accurate and fundamental understanding of the term or the teaching or the principle. So that's why we look at the first book and the first uh, instant instance where this word is mentioned. Now we see the mention of the word submission in Genesis chapter 16. But the actual act of submission, we see it being demonstrated by God himself, where in Genesis uh, chapter 2 verse 19, when God had ended over the authority unto men, and then now in 219, he makes or, or creates these creatures or the, the, the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. And then he brings them to Adam to name them. So God did not name the animal, but he submitted under the authority he had delegated and allowed the delegated authority, which was Adam, to name the animals. So now the, the way the uh, uh, submit in Hebrew is to be depressed, uh, to put down, to humble oneself. The Hebrew word is ana. In the New Testament, we also find uh, the word submit. The first time we encounter or come across this word is in Luke chapter 2, verse 51. The Greek word is, the Greek word for submit is Hupataso, uh, which is a, milita a military term to, which means to rank under or to arrange under. Now, let us look now at Genesis chapter 16, verse 9, which is the first encounter or the first verse where we encounter the word submit. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress, submit yourself under her hand. Now, this is the instant whereby um, 
Abraham and his wife Sarah could not have kids, and then Sarah uh, decided to take his servant maid Hagar and give to and give her to Abraham as his wife, so that he may bear children for her. So Abraham agreed uh, to be or to take uh, Hagar as his wife, and then he conceived. So now. This is, and after having conceived, then the word of God tells us that now Hagar became or despised her mistress. And then Sarah now repented of this act of, 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 of giving uh, Abraham Hagar as his wife. And therefore now it, it, he mistreated uh, who Hagar. So when Hagar saw that now things are changing and they are becoming difficult, he then fled. The second one is Luke chapter 2, 51 and 52, uh, which is the Hebrew word hupataso uh, that is found in the book of Luke, first encountered in the book of Luke. Reading from the book of Luke, verse 51, it says in 52, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured, treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in stature and in favor with God and men. It is therefore possible that Growth can be stunted because of lack of submission. Now, we see that in the previous verse or verses that we read, which is Luke chapter 2, 51 and 52, it tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ, even though being God, but he submitted to the fleshly authority which God had placed him under, which were his parents, because the word of God says that he submitted unto them. And then it also continues to tell us that he grew, he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with men. That tells us that our failure to submit to the authority that God has placed us under may lead us to the stunting of our growth. Our growth may be stunted because we are failing to submit to the authority that God has placed us under. Submission is conducive. It is a conducive and a fatal environment or fatal ground for our growth. Submission, therefore, is depressing oneself. It is arranging or ranking yourself under that particular authority which God has ordained that you, you should submit under. Submission is is the attitude of the heart. So if the, the way you accept, the way you see your delegated authority will determine to what extent you will be able to submit to him. If you do not have any honor or any respect for your delegated authority, then you will find it hard and impossible to submit unto him. Submission is man's duty, not God's duty. What does that tell us? It tells us that it is our own duty to, to submit, to place ourselves under the delegated authority. It is our duty to rank ourselves under that delegated authority. Because if we rank equal with the, the delegated authority, we will find it hard to submit to him. So we need to depress ourselves and submit under the delegated authority God has ordained for us. Since submission involves depressing oneself, it therefore includes humility. What is humility? Humility is to make yourself lower or to bring yourself lower. That means you first have to 
Be humble so that you'll be able to submit. You first have to make yourself lower than the set men so that you'll be able to submit under the set men. If you are equal to the set men, that means you will not be able to submit to him. This depression can be likened to one depressing and inflating an inflated ball into the body of water. It can be in 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 a, in, in a pool or anywhere you may contain the water. One who has done this exercise will realize that it is difficult and it is a hard thing to do. So even submission, it is not something that is easy. As much as it is difficult to depress a ball into the body of water, it is, not, it is also or equally uh, not easy to, to submit to the delegated authority because that speaks of breaking your own will so that you will be able to submit. That speaks of humility, making yourself lower than the set men. As we have said earlier, uh, that one cannot submit himself under authority up until he has humbled himself. We said, to humble yourself is to make yourself lower. And we said to submit is to rank under. So for you to be able to rank under, you need to make yourself lower. For you to be able to submit, you, make, you need to humble yourself. Now, humility is the duty of men, but it can also be the duty of God. What does this mean? It is unlike submission. Submission is the duty of men, but humility is the duty of men, but it can also be the duty of God. But it's not God's desire that he himself be the one who humbles you, but he desires that men should do what should humble themselves. If man chooses to humble himself, this will lead to exaltation. Now, if you look at the book of Philippians chapter 2, the word of God says that the Lord Jesus Christ humbled himself. He was not humbled by anyone. He was not humbled by God, but he himself humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. James chapter 4, also and as well as Peter, God is entreating and pleading with men. He says, submit to God and he will do what? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he's going to do what? He's going to exalt you in due time. So if one submits and humbles himself under the authority that God has said, then God is going to exalt him. That's why I say that humility will lead to exaltation because even our Lord Jesus Christ, when he himself humbled him, when he humbled himself, the Father exalted him. How? By giving him a name far above every name, that at the mention of this name, every knee should bow of the things in heaven, of the things in earth, and even of the things under the earth. Now, what happens if God humbles you? This leads to humiliation. If we look at the book of Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar was pompous and saw all these, his kingdom, the vast kingdom, he says, all this I have built by my power. And therefore God humbled him. How did he humble him? If you, re if you read the book of Daniel chapter 4, it is, he was humbled through the fulfill or by the fulfillment of the dream or the vision he had seen, which Daniel interpreted. When he saw, one, when he saw a huge tree that was cut, but it, this, the, the stump was left as well as its root. And the word of God tells us that 
that she was Nebuchadnezzar. So God humbled Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar was now becoming proud, was now becoming pompous. He did not honor God who gave him the authority, who delegated authority and brought all these kingdoms under his kingdom and gave him victory to be able to conquer other, other kingdoms so that his kingdom may increase. But when he was walking in his palace, he thought that all this that he has, it was by his own might. Therefore, God humbled him and made him to live with the beast of the field, to eat the grass for seven years. Then after seven years, God did what? He restored his kingdom and his glory which he had. Now, when God humbles one, it is not that he wants to humiliate you, but it is because God wants you to acknowledge him as God, that he is God who rules over all the kingdoms of the earth, and he gives them according to his desire. That's what he says to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, that's what God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to learn, that he is the one who gave him his kingdom. So when God uh, humbles one, he wants you to acknowledge him in all your ways. He wants you to know that whatever that you have, it was not through your own power, but it was through his intervention. It was through his grace. The opposite of humility is pride. The word of God says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of the Lord, and he is going to exalt you in due time. And then it says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So all those who are proud, God is able to resist them. That's why God says, humble yourself before I humble you. Man's nature is disposed to doing what is wrong than what is right. Therefore, to, it, 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 it means that now you have to apply much more effort to do that which is good than to do that which is bad. Now, submission is threefold. Submission is submission unto God. Submission is submission unto delegated authority. And submission is also submission unto one another. But we are going to focus on delegated authority as the subtopic of our teaching tonight. But let us just uh, look briefly at the other two. Let us look at James chapter 4. Uh, verse 7, which reads as follows. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So we, we see here that submission is also unto God. Now, submission unto men, First Peter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, Submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So we see also the other aspect of submission or facet of submission is that we also submit to God. So we submit to God, we submit to men, and we submit to his delegated authority. God and his delegated authority are inseparable. What do we mean by that? We mean that failure to submit to God's delegated authority is interpreted as failure to submitting to God. Resisting God's delegated authority is resisting God. Now, consider or let us remember um, what happened when when the children of Israel came to Samuel and said, Samuel, give us or make us a king for your sons whom we have made judges over us. 
They are failing to do their job faithfully. They are perverting justice. And the word of God, and the word of God tells us that Samuel was grieved in his spirit, but God said to him, Now heed the voice of the people, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. So this tells us clearly that rejecting the authority or the delegated or God's delegated authority is actually rejecting God. The degree of submission will measure out to the degree of authority. This means that the extent we are willing to submit to God's dele delegated authority will determine the extent or the amount of authority we are going to be entrusted with. Remember Elisha. Elisha asked for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. And because he was submissive unto the end, he was able to get this double portion. He was going to get the, 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 the portion of Elijah's spirit, but because he submitted unto the end, whatever that he asked, he was able to receive. He was able to receive the full uh, available authority that God was able or was willing to give unto him. So now, the extent to which we are willing to submit to the delegated authority will measure out the authority that God is able to entrust us with. The kingdom of God operates under the principles of submission, obedience, as well as authority. It is not about the zeal that you have, but it's about the authority. You may have the zeal to preach, but by what authority are you preaching? So it is very important to be able to know this principle and to be able to work and to operate within those principles. If you remember in Acts chapter 16, the word of God says that Paul desired to go and preach the word of God in Asia as well as in Bithynia. But the Spirit of the Lord did not allow him to go to those places. Even though he had the zeal, even though he had the desire, even though he had these many revelations, but God did not permit him to go and preach. He only permitted him to go and preach in Macedonia because that's where God's authority or uh, his authority he had placed over him had extended to. God demands submission to his delegate authority regardless of whether they are good or whether they are harsh. We do not submit to authority because they are treating us well. We do not submit to authority because they are friendly to us. We submit to authority because it is God who has placed them there. We submit to the office, not to the men in the office, because men may change, just like we submit to the, for example, let's take the office of presidency. We submit to the office of presidency, not to the president, because the president or the person in presidency, the person in presidency in South Africa, we know that it changes after five years. But the presidency, the office, remains. We do not submit to the man even after he has uh, left the seat of authority or the seat or the office, or evacuated the office of presidency. But we submit to the office of presidency regardless of the person sitting in that office. So God demands us uh, to submit to his authority. Let us look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Seventh, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the harsh. For this 
is commendable if because of conscience towards God one enjoys grief, suffering wrongfully. Now, this is the Holy Spirit. He is now commanding every servant to be submissive to their masters, not only to those who are good, but also to those who are harsh. With what? With all fear. What fear? Fear of their masters? No. But fear of God. With all fear of God. As I've said earlier, that is not the person in the office who commands respect, but it is the office, the position of authority delegated by God. This is the office that commands respect. It is not the person who commands respect. So we respect the office, not the man sitting in office. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. As we have said earlier, that we are, submit, we, are, we are to submit to our masters with all fear. I would like us to stop there for tonight, and we are going to continue in our next teaching to look at, as we were looking at the school of servanthood, we looked at um, that there are two major modules that are studied, that one needs by all chance and by all diligence and to make sure that he passes those uh, modules. That the first one was submission. Now the second one is obedience. I'd like us to look at obedience in our next teaching. Let us pray. Let us close now by prayer and ask God to help us and to teach us and to make us to be able to submit unto his authority because he says in his word we are the one who are supposed to submit ourselves to his authority let us ask him now to be to give us the spirit of humility so that we will be able to submit under his given authority because as you remember when you spoke earlier that it is not feasible for one to submit if one is not lower you cannot submit to someone who is, whom you are above. You cannot submit to someone whom you are equal to. But you need to submit. You, you need to humble yourself first so that you'll be able to submit to the one whom God has placed as your delegated authority. Our Lord Jesus Christ indeed is God. But the word of God says that even though he is God, but he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. But he what? He, he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. He humbled himself and became obedient. So the Lord Jesus Christ could not serve us uh, up until he submits under the authority. So let us pray and ask God to help us to be able to humble ourselves because it is not a good thing to be humbled by God, but it is preferable that one humbles himself. Now, let us pray and ask God that to help us to break our will so that we may be able to humble ourselves because if we fail to humble ourselves, he is going to humble us. Let us pray. Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we thank you. Our good God, for what you have taught us this day, we are standing before you and asking you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that you may teach us humility and help us that we may be able to humble ourselves. Help us, our Lord, to be able to bend our will to your will, our Lord. We pray so that we may be able to humble ourselves to avoid being humbled by you because if we humble ourselves we know that you are going to exalt us in due time but hum humbling humbling by your own hand will lead to our humiliation therefore we ask you our lord that you may give us that desire that you may help us to bend our will and uh, that we'll be able to humble ourselves under your mighty hand we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen.